been a good friend for a very long time, and he's been an amazing force here at the Aspen Institute, and I wouldn't feel at home unless Elliot introduced me. So th- thank you to Elliot. That's really true. Uh, the subject I teach is political philosophy, and what I w- would like to do today is to have a discussion. But as but first an observation about the way we argue about politics today in the United States. And we talked some about this in the earlier panel, those of you who may have been here. Political argument in the United States isn't going so well these days. There are the shouting matches on cable television and talk radio, and it isn't much better on the floor of Congress. Some people say that's because we've let moral questions and opinions intrude too much in political argument, and that puts us at loggerheads. We can't possibly agree. I think the opposite is our problem, that we have shied away from engaging in public discourse with big moral questions that matter and that we all really do care about. So what we find is that our political arguments are either technocratic, managerial, and very dry, or shouting matches. What I think we need to do to elevate the terms of public discourse is to find our way to a morally more robust way of thinking and arguing in public about politics. And to do that is to bring us, to require that we bring ourselves into contact with the big ideas about justice, morality, ethics, rights, virtue, the common good, the big ideas that lie just beneath the surface of the arguments we have. And to engage with those ideas and to do it well and thoughtfully requires that we take up some big questions of philosophy, and that's what we're going to do today. Today we're going to talk about the German philosopher Immanuel Kant. This will be, you didn't know this was going to be a lecture about Kant, the 18th century German philosopher. But that's what you've gotten yourselves into. But before we turn to Kant, let's have a discussion. When the special forces found and killed Osama bin Laden, there was a revival for a time of the debate about torture. Some people said, we only got him because of the waterboarding and the torture. And other people said, no, that's not true. I'm interested in the ethical question lying behind that debate. Suppose it were true that what led us to bin Laden was information gained by torture or waterboarding, would that have justified the torture? Let's just begin with a show of hands. How many say, yes, we got bin Laden. If we had to torture some of his compatriots, it was worth it. Raise your hands, those of you who who say yes. And who disagrees? Raise your hand if you disagree. That would not have justified torture, getting bin Laden. All right, let's start with those who disagree, who say it would not be justified. Why? Who's willing to explain why he or she thinks that torture, even if it would enable us to get bin Laden, is wrong? Who will get us started? Yes. Stand up and we'll get you a microphone. I think it's. I think it would have been wrong because, because there's a greater good, and I think there's a greater good than 
than getting this one man who did a really terrible thing. But I think there's a greater good. Which is? That you, that, that, we, that, that we not support, that we not support torture, that we not support... But why? We're trying to get at why. Because I think that, because I think that if you, if you go down the ends justifying the means road very far, uh, it becomes very difficult to draw the line. So uh, uh, um, um, <clears throat> if you justify torture as the means to get to the end of killing bin Laden, then, then the question is, well, how, far, how much further down the... But in this case, what about just in this case? I it's think a one-shot th- deal. Morally speaking. No, not good enough. It's still wrong? It's yeah. wrong to torture even if it would get us bin Laden? Yeah. What do you say? Hello? Okay, there's better. Hi, I'm Josh Rivera. I'm 17. I'm from Chicago Debate League. And um, I think when evaluating political morality, it cannot be seen in a vacuum. So take in, let's take Bin Laden, right? We get one guy and we torture a bunch. How is that seen then in the world as the way in which liberal democracy finds its way to deal so with it would, security? So it would give us a bad reputation. Not just a bad reputation, but do we resort to the tactics of oppressive regimes in a country where everyone here supposedly says we're great? You know, if we are technologically sophisticated... But wait, 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 but I want to know if it's wrong. Okay, if it's wrong, sure. It is wrong. Why is it wrong? Because it's a self-fulfilling process. The demonization of a body through torture produces the conditions by which terrorists attack us. You know, if they think Americans are infidels and we take that process back, it creates the other fulfilling process. let Let me up the ante a little bit. Suppose it's not torture to catch bin Laden. Suppose it's September 10th, 2001... And you've got, you've captured someone who knows about the plot to crash the planes into the World Trade Centers. And he won't tell you when and where and how. Would it be justified to torture that person if you could prevent the attacks on 9 11? Let's take that poll. How many say yes? In that case, yes. More people. How many say even in that case, no? It'd be wrong. Even then. So. All right, why, why would it be wrong, even in that case, if you could prevent the death of all these people? Who can explain why it would nonetheless be wrong? Laura. Come on. Torture is evil. And in that sense, we cannot be sure that even the information we get from that person is going to be correct. Well, let's assume, though, that it would, in this case, be correct. Do you have, is there some prince? You say it's evil. Does that mean it's always wrong? Anyone? We don't have to only to pick on Laura. But you can... Who has a principled objection to torture? Yes. And why, and, wait, there are people like that. You can applaud if you want. <laughs> what, what's your name again? Joanne. Joanne. And why is it always wrong, even if it can achieve good things like saving lives? Why is it always wrong? No, go ahead. There's some absolute moral principle that's violated when we torture. Even to save 3,000 lives. Yes. And you say it's childish, but it's a pretty powerful idea. It's simple. Who disagrees with Joanne? Who, who is willing to take on her argument <laughs> about it being absolutely wrong to torture? Who disagrees? Yes. What do you say? Sitting. In the sweater, yeah, the dark sweater. 
Yes. Uh, Clive Crook. Clive, um, yes, hi. <laughs> this, this position uh, is that torture is impermissible under any conceivable circumstances. Right, that's Joanne's position, right? And I'm, I'm afraid I just find that a dishonest position. I mean, you could up the ante far more than 9-11. Would it be wrong to torture one person to save the planet? I, I find that an unintelligible uh, let, point of view, frankly. Let's, let's get another... Stay there, Clive. Let's get another... Micro, let's get a microphone back to Joanne. Go ahead. What do you... You can do it. Come on. Stand up. Clive, you can stay there with your microphone. Go ahead. What do you say to, what do you say to him? <laughs> All right. All right. We don't. Another defender, but someone who agrees with the view that it's absolutely wrong, in principle, to torture even to save 3,000 lives. Who holds that view and wants to explain why? Down here. I think that Clive answered it, because you can always find an excuse. And therefore? And therefore you can't start. No, but, well, Clive, what do you say? So it's not an excuse, it's a reason. I mean, put yourself in that position. That's the intellectual, that's the thought experiment we are being invited to do. Put yourself in that position. Would, Would you, you honestly say... No, we won't torture that one person, and we will let the planet die. Would you, I don't believe you if that's, if that's what you're telling me. Would you torture somebody to save your son? Would you torture somebody to save your friend? Would you torture somebody to save somebody you don't the, know over here? These are, these, are very, these are very difficult decisions. My view is that it is, it is a matter in the end of weighing uh, what is at stake. And it is conceivable to me that sometimes the stakes are so high that our disgust at the idea of torture, it would be right to suppress that and torture nonetheless. Now, there are further distinctions to be made, obviously, about whether you enshrine torture as a policy. I'm against that. But the way Michael put the question, it seems to me I am compelled to say in that particular case, to save 3,000 lives... And, and let's suppose that was all that was at stake, then it seems to me... You would go for it. I would go for it, yeah. And, and if there were a kidnapping, just to take it uh, another case, kidnapping, a child is kidnapped, and you, the guy comes to collect the ransom, the kidnapper, he's caught, but he won't say where that child is hidden. Would you torture him, Clive? I would need to think very hard about that. Uh, Joanne? No, I wouldn't. Let's get you the microphone. I would not say. Even to find out where that child was. Right. All right. What, what this discussion that we've just had brings out are two different philosophies of justice. One of them, Joanne said it was a childish view, but it was actually the view held by Immanuel Kant, maybe the greatest, at least the greatest modern philosopher. He held Joanne's so-called childish view. He thought that justice is not about calculating consequences. The highest moral principle, Kant taught, is respecting human dignity, respecting persons as ends in themselves, and to torture them or to mistreat them for the sake even of good ends is to fail to respect their dignity. It's to use them as a thing, as an object. But persons are not things. That's Kant's reason for the absolute, or he would say categorical principle that Joan articulated. Now, he would disagree with Clive because Clive is invoking the consequences, adding up lives in the World Trade Center, 
when those lives matter. A utilitarian would add up the consequences in lives or in economic growth or in happiness in deciding the right thing to do. For Jeremy Bentham, a utilitarian philosopher, the right thing to do is whatever will produce the best overall consequences, the best overall results. Here we're talking about lives, but it needn't only be about lives. It could be about happiness, about which there's been much discussion this week. Kant says morality isn't even about maximizing happiness. It's about respecting human dignity. But respecting human dignity in that way can exact a heavy moral toll, as Clive was emphasizing, all those lives. I'd, what I'd like to do now that we've identified this principle of Kant, this categorical insistence on respecting human dignity, I'd like to show you how this argument that we've just had was argued by three people who were, whom I spoke to as part of the documentary that Elliot just described. It was a documentary that the BBC just showed about justice. And part of the documentary is looking at the debate between utilitarians and those in the tradition of Kant who say there are certain categorical rights to do with respect for human dignity that can't be sacrificed even for good ends. So as we bring down the shades so that you can see it more clearly, let me tell you about the three people who joined the argument whom I met in the course of this. Two are in Germany. One of them is Dieter Grimm, who is a German constitutional scholar. He served for a time on the uh, German Supreme Court, Supreme Constitutional Court. The, uh, another person in Germany is a journalist called Carolyn Emke, who writes about human rights, and she visits war-torn parts of the world and covers uh, atrocities, ethnic cleansing, and the like. And then you will also meet Peter Singer, who is probably the most prominent utilitarian philosopher today. What I'd like you to do as you watch this short video clip is to see who you think has the better of the argument as between these two different philosophies of justice. So, so there you have some people engaged in arguments quite similar to the ones with which we began. Who do you think, which side got the better of that argument, do you think? The, util the utilitarian Peter Singer or or Carolyn Emke, the Kantian, who, who, who thinks, uh, who thinks the, the uh, Kantian got the, had the better of the argument? And who thought uh, the utilitarian singer? And would someone say uh, why? Why you think that? Wh whichever vote you... Whichever... Are you talking to me? Go ahead. I think when you invoke the categorical imperative, you have to consider the distinction between, or, or the lack of distinction, between acts, acts of commission and acts of omission. And um, if you could stop the torturing of 20,000 people by torturing one, then I think you have to torture the one. Although that's commission, that's not omission. Well, that's omission by, stop, by right. not stopping. All right, but so you're with Peter Singer then? Yes, yeah, absolutely. All right. And is there, is any, is there someone here who took one view when we had the initial discussion and who, listening to the debate between the two of them, changed his or her view. Did, you, did someone find his or her view changing? Did you? Yes. The woman... Uh, yes. All right. Let, let's... Here, tell us. I'm just wondering... You did change. I did change. From what to what? Kidnap the young boy, and obviously the young boy w was tortured because just being kidnapped to me—it's like how do you define torture? There's so many different 
I guess, degrees of torture. And then I'm thinking about an eye for an eye. So why not, if this man tortured this boy and we could find out maybe where the boy was, then maybe why not consider in this instance torturing this man? It's like an eye for an eye. So the kidnapper deserves to be tortured, have given what he's done. That actually leads us to a third ethic, different from the two we've been discussing, which is that justice means answering to what people deserve. In fact, the issue of the, the idea that he deserves to be treated badly and therefore should be tortured is actually an interesting point because what it shows is that in many of the debates we have about torturing the terrorist suspect to get the information or to find out where the ticking bomb is, many people say yes and think it's on utilitarian grounds, all those lives versus this one suffering person. But in fact... I suspect that most who favor torture in that case of the terrorist suspect are relying on a non-utilitarian reason of the kind you just raised. Well, he's a terrorist after all. He planted the bomb. Doesn't he deserve it anyhow? It doesn't really depend only on the numbers. The test of whether the case for torture depends on numbers, utilitarian considerations or the idea that this fellow deserves it, is brought out by the counterexample to Singer. All right, suppose you had to torture someone who didn't deserve it, the 14-year-old girl. The way you answer that question determines whether your case for torture is based on the idea of an eye for an eye, or whether it's truly based, Clive, on numbers. Now, you could save. We'll put one more question to Clive. Clive, you can, say, you can avoid 9-11. You can save 3,000 lives by torturing one person, the daughter, the 14-year-old daughter of the terrorist suspect. Do you do it then? I think that's very hard. The way I would think about it, I think, might be to ask myself if I would volunteer to be tortured in that case. Um, but I found the discussion a little bit between... Do uh, you think that the terrorist suspect would be swayed by the sight of you, Clive? No. No, I don't know. no, no. no. <laughs> that's, that, that's not the thought experiment. I mean, Let's the, say the he's not is, that empathetic. Sing, not sing that empathetic. The, it seems to me... I, I think you're actually muddying the waters by sticking with the 9-11 uh, case. All right, take singers. The, the, take no, singers the, no, to What do no, you answer to that? No, I don't want to take that case. You don't I, want to. I, 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 wa- no. I want to take the case of the death of the planet. That's the clarifying instance. I'm not we, so sure. We all I'm not die. So sure. We all die. Would it, in that case, would it be warranted? Would it be morally justified to torture an innocent baby? I think the answer, as disgusting as it may be, must be yes. But let me just make one other point here. I found the discussion between Singer and the uh, German, was she a philosopher or a lawyer, I'm not sure, very frustrating. And I think this is your fault, Michael, because you're, <laughs> you're setting the case up to force us to choose between these two ethics. It must be the categor- categorical imperative or it must be utilitarianism. Plainly, it's both. They have to be weighed. Why should one of these ethical schemes be able to veto right, the other well, if, in its entirety. All right, if you think it's a matter of weighing, then you aren't really neutralized between the two schemes. You're on the utilitarian or the consequentialist side. But what I would like to say is that the question that I put to them um, was not a fanciful hypothetical. I have plenty of those. What's interesting, and this gets back to the broader theme about our public life and the way we reason together about ethical dilemmas, the question that they were debating was a question that actually uh, gripped the German public and that required the German court to make a decision. It wasn't my fanciful hypothetical. The German public debated this, and the court had to decide whether to punish the guy who had... He hadn't actually tortured. He had threatened to torture, which is another twist on this. Let me step back from this very short lecture on the ethics of Immanuel Kant, I think that what our discussion and theirs brings out is that 
the views we take on ethical dilemmas that arise all the time in public life and in our everyday lives implicate us in big philosophical ideas on which we have opinions and convictions, but we don't often work them out and articulate them and test them. And so what I think we need to do, getting back now to the state of our public discourse, the character of our public life, what I think we need to do is to engage more directly with the challenge of articulating the moral principles that underlie the views we have, whether it's about what to do with Osama bin Laden or a kidnapper, or whether it has to do with income inequality, tax policy, what to do about the deficit, what to do about same-sex marriage or affirmative action. All of these questions involve big philosophical issues to do with justice and rights and virtue and moral desert, and whether to balance or whether to insist on certain categorical duties and principles. We've been speaking here about our own domestic political arguments and about the poverty, I would describe it as the poverty, of our public discourse. Eliot mentioned the fact that part of this project has enabled the, uh, the Justice uh, series, which uh, PBS ran, based on the Harvard class, not only to be seen in the United States, but in other societies, in large part due to the Internet, people watching it online. New technology creates an opportunity for public discourse and also for moral discourse that reaches across cultures and across national boundaries. The fact that the technology itself doesn't do anything to increase human understanding or to improve uh, public discussion of hard questions. But it does give us an opportunity to try to create across cultures the same kind of public discussion and argument on big questions that we've been having here. So an experiment that intrigues me as a follow-on to this project is to see what will happen if instead of discussing these questions only with a bunch of students gathered in one place, we can use technology and the fact that they can now, in all different parts of the world, view these debates, form views of their own, defend views of their own, drawing in some cases on their own tradition, in other cases on these philosophers. What would happen if we could link, through video link technology, students in different countries and debate these questions? What would be the similarities? What would be the differences in the moral and philosophical outlooks? I want to show you, if we could lower the shades once more, I want to show you one last excerpt. This from an early version of a global classroom experiment that I did for NHK, which is Japan's national public television, where we had a discussion on some hard ethical questions with students linked in, uh, from, in Tokyo, in Shanghai, and in Boston. It was just after the earthquake disaster in Japan. So we focused on the ethic that lay behind the Japanese response to the crisis, the civility, the sense of community with which they responded. Then we asked questions about the future of nuclear power. Does this disaster give reason to rethink the reliance on nuclear power? And we ended with a discussion about whether we should aspire to a universal global ethic or whether that's a mistake. So this is really mainly to give you the flavor of those discussions and an early experiment in creating a global classroom. So Mark, if we could show that clip. アメリカ、ハーバード大学の学生たち。中国の名門、上海、福丹大学の学生たち。東京大学など日本の学生。そして、経験豊かな4人のゲストを加え、グローバルに議論を行います。<笑> 
私たちは3月11日以降の世界をどう生きるのか希望と再生の道を探ります。こんばんばはマイケル・サンデルですこれは日本で起きた大震災と世界の反応をテーマにした特別講義ですこの災害は人々にとって世界にとってどんな問題を投げかけているのか人間の倫理や価値観についてファミリーだっていう気持ちが強いと思うんです私は原子力発電の問題点の一つがあのリスクを負う場所と恩恵を受ける場所があの違っているということです。From like airplane or other technologies.、Um, from this crisis, we know this、uh, nuclear leak actually a f f e c t China and also America. So I think it's,、uh, it needs、uh, world's attention and world's effort. The philosopher Rousseau, Jean Jacques Rousseau, Rousseau wrote It seems that the sentiment of humanity evaporates and weakens in being extended over the entire world. He was suggesting that human sympathy and concern can't be global, can't be universal. If I was a person who was living in the YouTube, I would like to see this movie. 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 In this age where communication is at the heart of the matter, I think that it is possible to,、uh, to sympathize with countries a half, a, half、um, a world away. And I think that it's important to note that、uh, in the case where there's a natural disaster,、uh, I think that sort of brings us together as a community. I am a little bit skeptical, skeptical about whether we can really move towards a Identity of universal or global citizen, as we call.、Um, I felt a lot of pride in the humans that weren't looting, that weren't hoarding, and in kind of finding out information like this of things going on in Japan, of, of actions of the Japanese people, of you know, people that were acting as heroes, things like this. I felt a human pride. Congo. 日本の皆さんそして善意をもって支援をしようという世界中の人々はこの議論の中に何かを見いだしてくれればと願います参加してくれたみんなどうもありがとう、right, we can lift up the lift up the shades so that gives you The flavor of it. It was our first attempt at having,、uh, from at least three different parts of the world, a global discussion on some of these ethical questions. So, as this is a project that intrigues me, our hope is to develop this further so that we could have simultaneously included students from even more countries than three. And it will give us an opportunity, well, two things. It'll give us a chance. To see how thoughtful young people from different parts of the world think about these questions. It will enable us to learn from the experiment we've done. So it's not just a matter of putting out a, a classroom or a series of lectures, but also a, about learning from the ways in which people in different parts of the world think about these questions. And maybe, this is the last thing, maybe. If we are able to engage students and groups of students 
here and elsewhere around the world in serious discussion of big moral questions as they bear on public life, maybe we can somehow find a way to translate that kind of moral engagement to elevate the terms of our public discourse more generally. That, at least, is my hope. Thank you very much. We have time, we have time for questions, some questions. So, who, who would like to put a question? In the back. This maybe takes it back to the more narrow, but I was interested in the question that you said, you know, got us onto another tangent of the German police officer uh, or, or police chief who threatened but didn't actually torture seems to me to be a very big, you know, what, what ended up happening to him is, uh, is an important part of the discussion. Is, is there a big difference between the threat and the actual torturing? Yeah, and you're suggesting that there is a difference. Yes. Yeah. I think so. The question is, even if there is a difference, um, what, sh- should, uh, what are the rights and wrongs of the two cases? Admittedly, the threat and the torture itself are, are morally speaking, two different cases. But we would still have to then decide in each case whether a categorical moral principle is at stake or whether we should weigh the consequences. But they are different. Yes? When the guy murdered George Tiller saying that he was going to save unborn babies by killing the abortion doctor, is it the same theory that he's using as you're using on the torture question? It's similar in the sense that torturing or killing one person is being justified in the name of saving more. Now, in the case of the claim by the person killing an abortion doctor, there are really two questions, not one. There's the question that's the same as whether you kill or torture the terrorist to prevent 3,000 lives from being lost. There's that question. And then there's the second, actually the prior question, which is whether the killer, the abortion opponent killer, is right or wrong in his belief that saving thousands of hundreds, in this case maybe, of unborn lives is morally comparable to saving already born persons. And that's a debate that we'd have to, we'd have, to have. So there are two moral issues there. But the structure of the argument might be similar. Yes. I love your idea of the experiment of the students. But why limit it to students? Why not our social um, um, workshops that we've had across the country when, during presidential elections, or even uh, officials? Yeah, it's why, interesting. Why does not? I it mean, wouldn't ha- there be a great cross section of thinking yeah. that would come up with some interesting answers? Yes, it's a good suggestion, and ideally. We could do this experiment not only with students, but with public officials, with elected officials, or with the general public. And I've done a few of these, and so it's really just a matter of uh, when the opportunity arises to do the one or to do the other. Even in the clip you saw, I forgot to mention this, there were four grown-ups who were also sitting there. Uh, One an actress, one a writer, one a, a business person whom they brought in because they wanted... um, These were recognizable public figures in Japan, and they thought it would be more interesting... It would help the ratings if there were famous people there, famous to the audience. So uh, it didn't work so well that they were combined with the students. We might have them in a separate discussion. But in principle, you're right. It would be an experiment worth doing on a broader scale. election, uh, the town... Halls were some of the most fascinating cross sections of uh, discussions I had heard. Right. No, it could work in town halls. The only qualification would be you get a different quality of discussion if the people engaged in it, whether in a town hall or in a classroom or in a bunch of video link classrooms, you have a better discussion if there is some shared background knowledge, if they've read some of the same texts or articles, if they've debated among themselves already, 
then you get up a higher level. So just walking in cold to a town hall, you could do it up to a point, but the ideal, if we're really concerned with creating civic education, it would be to have those people in the town hall first spend a few evenings or weekends reading some provocative texts that would be the basis for the discussion. But in principle, yes, it could be done with the general public, and I would be interested in doing that. Yes, in the very back. Go ahead, in the front, in the very back. Go ahead. So I'm a scientist, and I have a, I think, an uncomfortable question, which is, Michael, imagine there was a technology that became available that, without torture, would allow you to access the brain of the terrorist, a truth serum, if you will, and you would do this involuntarily. Um, so the person may not agree, but you would voluntarily, con- involuntarily confine them and through some kind of device access their brain and thereby able to create the, the meaning of whatever they were hiding. Now, walk me through this a little bit. I guess my question is, do you find it the case that these inventions of these new technologies allows you to finesse your way out of some of these clearly ancient ethical dilemmas? Or do you feel as if the invention of these new technologies just returns you back to the same ethical dilemmas that were posed two centuries right. ago? Right, good question. The second. The new technology uh, may give rise to new uh, forms of these questions. But to take the example of confining the person giving him a kind of high-tech truth serum or brain imaging to find out the information. Which actually doesn't lie outside the realm of impossible, by the way. This is not completely it, it, far-fetched. It seems to have the appeal of avoiding the actual pain and screaming. But the question from Kant's point of view would be, is this using the person as a means rather than respecting the person as an end and as a subject of human dignity? And you would still have to have that debate about whether it violates human dignity, it's against his will, just as surely as the torture is against his will. Is it only the pain, this is the question, that that only the the pain that makes torture objectionable, or is it the violation of the dignity of the person? And if the dignity is at stake, then arguably the Kantian view would condemn the high-tech Uh, brain imaging version um, as well as the torture version. But the general point, however it would come out, the general point is that uh, new technology does not absolve us of the uh, need or the responsibility to engage in these hard questions. And and how many Singarians would be converted to Kantians when you gave them the non-pain version of this? How many what? How many people from the Singer camp would be converted to the Kant camp or vice versa, if you gave them the, the non-pain version of this. Well, I have to try that in a subsequent episode. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, do we... Uh, how much time do we have? Do we have time for one? One question. Yeah, last one? Okay. Um, who, yeah, oh, what, do you have? Linda, go ahead, Linda. I just wonder, uh, besides the irony of this all happening in Germany, which maybe I was the only one that noticed, but um, where, where is PETA and people that care about animals? Where should they fall? And, you know, I, I've heard uh, people from PETA say that I wouldn't cure cancer if I had to torture one mouse. So where is that in in right. this whole right. uh, concept. All right, well, you've actually raised two questions. Let me take the PETA question first. The, one of the, um, the thing that really made Peter Singer famous, the utilitarian, um, is that he, because he rejects ideas of human dignity as something apart, because he's a utilitarian, he said we have to be as concerned with pain to animals and suffering of sentient beings as with human beings who suffer pain. Pain is pain, whether it's human pain or animal pain. And he became one of the leaders of the animal rights movement. And it flowed from his utilitarian philosophy. And 
So that's where he's had his greatest influence. Paradoxically, or not so paradoxically, if you think about it. Because if, morally speaking, pain and pleasure are what matter, then there should be no difference in principle between the way we treat human beings and the way we treat animals, hence the animal rights movement. And he's been a huge figure in that. Now, on the, uh, the <coughs> fact that this discussion, much of it was in Germany, we went there deliberately to Germany and Greece for Aristotle and Britain for Jeremy Bentham and the States to some extent. One of the reasons that the language of human dignity figures so powerfully in German constitutional law and public discourse, and the, the, the woman journalist was an eloquent uh, ex- expression of this, is the experience of the Holocaust. So it's not as if, though Kant was German, he was a Prussian, it's not as though this Kantian idea of human dignity has been powerful throughout German history since Kant wrote. It hasn't been. In a way, German public culture discovered Kant and human dignity in the aftermath of the Holocaust as a way of looking for a language to explain the enormity of the moral crime. And that has shaped public discussion and law on all these other questions, including even the kidnapper. It's an interesting question. Thank you very much. Thank you.